Um, good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to this event organized by Engineers Ireland West Region uh, as part of the Engineering National Development CPD series. Uh, this series marks the publication of Ireland's latest national development plan and aims to showcase and promote new ideas for engineering practice across all sectors aligned with the Project Ireland 2040 strategy. My name is Magda Hajdukevic, and I'm the current chairperson of the West Region Committee. And I want to introduce uh, our four fantastic speakers for tonight. Uh, the first one is Michael Goss, who is a chartered engineer and his current role is asset planning lead wastewater networks uh, in Irish Water. And prior to joining Irish Water in 2014, Michael worked in engineering consultancies on multiple water and wastewater projects. He has a degree in structural engineering from DIT and a master's degree in environmental engineering from UCD. He is a past chairman of the civil division in Engineers Ireland. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Sean Mulligan, who is the founder of Vortec Water Solutions, a water technology and services spin-out company from NUI Galway. He was previously a postdoctoral research engineer at NUI Galway, working in the field of urban water infrastructure. Sean is also a member of the IAHR leadership team on hydraulic structures, whose role is to champion the subject area of hydraulic infrastructure at an international level in an era of increasing specialization in the hydraulics profession. Our third speaker is Dr. Ronan Royston, a chartered engineer, chartered civil engineer with a demonstrated history of working in the civil engineering industry. He is skilled in structural engineering, construction, wastewater treatment, and geotech geotechnical engineering. Ronan successfully completed his PhD in geotechnical engineering from University of Oxford. Ronan uh, currently works with Wardenburg Construction. And our final speaker tonight is Karen Dobsky, uh, a marine ecologist working in Trinity College Dublin. She's an environmental activist, the coordinator and co-founder of Coast Watch Europe, an environmental NGO, uh, and a member of the European Environmental Bureau. Karen speaks and campaigns regularly on environmental issues, especially affecting water quality, wetlands, dunes, and batting, uh, batting beaches. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to cover the um, Atlone Main Drainage Scheme, um, and uh, it's a scheme that uh, it, it's very important to, to Irish water at the moment. Um, and I suppose just by giving you a, a bit of background first, uh, before we go through the scheme, um, the last previous uh, main drainage works uh, carried out in that loan uh, were in, in the late 1980s and in, early, in the early 1990s. Uh, and that culminated in a, a new treatment plant being built there in 92 with a capacity of 30,000 PE. Um, and I suppose more recently, that treatment plant has been upgraded at, with a capacity to treat 36,000 PE in 2018. And so we haven't really seen any major uh, improvements to the network uh, since, since the late 1980s. Uh, we have uh, a project team that are, are delivering or working on the scheme. Uh, it includes representatives from Irish Water in, in partnership with Meath County Council, uh, and they're supported uh, by Jennings O'Donovan and J.B. Barrys, who are giving technical, um, technical and engineering services uh, support. Um, I suppose just uh, in terms of that loan and uh, it, its constraints and challenges that it poses when working in that area. Obviously, the proximity to the River Shannon is a is a is a is an issue. Um, it's a busy navigation channel. It has amenity, it has recreational activities going on, um, and obviously then uh, it has uh, large fluctuations in level, in, in level uh, depending uh, whether it's uh, summer or winter. There's protected sites nearby, uh, including uh, SBAs and SACs. Uh, there's sites of historical significance. Um, we're also working within the floodplain of the River Shannon itself. It's also an urban environment as well. So you have traffic, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, people living and working in the area uh, that need to be uh, considered. And also uh, the poor ground conditions uh, in, in the Athlone area. Um, and 
that can't be understated. Um, the, the ground conditions consist of very soft clay overlaying uh, uh, boulder clay overlaying rock. Um, and that soft clay has been described as uh, having the consistency of, of toothpaste. Uh, so very soft indeed. Um, in terms of uh, planning, um, Athlone is designated under the National Planning Framework as a key regional growth centre with anticipated target growth up to uh, 2031 of 30,000. Uh, and it has an existing population of um, just around 21 to 22,000 at the moment. And back in the 1980s, when the original uh, sewerage scheme was being put in place, uh, the population was in the order of 14 to 15,000. So there's been a significant element of growth uh, since the last uh, main drainage works were put in place. So what, we, what are we trying to achieve uh, with the at low main drainage scheme? Well, I suppose the main primary objective is to achieve environmental compliance. And this means bringing the scheme into compliance with the Urban Waste Water Treatment Directive. Uh, the Athlone agglomeration, and the, particularly the, the network, was deemed uh, non-compliant with this directive in 2019 in, in uh, by the European Court of Justice, along with a number of other uh, collection networks uh, in the country. And also, we want to bring it in compliance with the uh, wastewater discharge license that uh, is under the EPA, and it's listed as a priority action law, uh, listed as a priority action uh, area with the, by the EPA. We also want to reduce the risk of sewer flooding. Um, at the moment, uh, flooding is, is impacting both uh, roads and property. We want to provide uh, sufficient capacity also to allow for growth and future development. And there's significant operational risks associated with the existing assets that are, that are failing, primarily around the wastewater pumping stations um, and uh, much of those assets are just reaching the end of life. The main, I suppose, tool that we have in terms of design tool is a, a verified hydraulic model um, that was put in, that was built uh, to assess the current level of performance of the network um, and to uh, determine what solutions are required to address the deficiencies and also provide that additional capacity for future growth and development. Uh, and that's, um, hydraulic model was uh, uh, brought in by the, or, or built by the uh, uh, consultants employed on, on the project uh, under Irish Water and Westmeath County Council. Uh, the drainage scheme itself um, in, involves uh, two contracts, uh, wastewater network upgrade contract, uh, which is by far the the biggest element of work, and then a smaller piece of work involves uh, sewer rehabilitation, uh, but, but it's still very, very important in terms of um, what it's trying to achieve and, and drive down inflow and, and uh, infiltration that's happening from groundwater and river water entering into the network. The, uh, the works carried out will reduce the risk of sewer flooding and the frequency of operation of combined sewer overflows or stormwater overflows, as they're referred to in the um, EU directive. Um, by the provision of increase in conveyance capacity of the sewers, additional storage, and also increasing the pump forward capacity at the pumping stations. The inflow and infiltration is looking to reduce um, uh, uh, reduction. Uh, it it will, will be implemented by carrying out uh, repairs to the existing defective sewers and manholes that are on the network. Um, particularly uh, those in proximity to the, the River Shannon itself along the East and West Bank. Um, and as I said earlier, we just want to increase the capacity, obviously, to, to cater for that additional population growth and development in that loan. And there'll be a high um, element of multi-agency uh, involvement, including uh, liaison with uh, Westmeath County Council and the OPW regarding the ongoing flood alleviation works uh, that are going on uh, in, in that long. Just to give you an idea of what's involved in the project scope, and this was determined by the outputs uh, of the hydraulic model, um, we're looking at close to two kilometres of sewer um, with 
the intention there to obviously minimize uh, traffic and and um, impact to the environment. Uh, we're looking at about a kilometer of the sewers and rise mains. We have two major crossings of the River Shannon. Um, we're putting in place two uh, new uh, wastewater pumping stations. And we're also removing five of the existing pumping stations uh, to deal with those operational deficiencies that are there at the moment. And we're putting in a new rising main going from the terminal pumping station at Golden Island to the treatment plant to increase the conveyance uh, to the wastewater works. Um, the sewer rehabilitation um, involves two phases of work, an initial work that's actually being carried out at the moment near the quay uh, at Lone Castle, where we're uh, repairing 60 metres of large diameter man entry sewer, which is a brick sewer, and we've some photographs of that that we can show you in, in the next few slides. And also then we are um, later on this year and early next year, we'll be carrying out a survey and repair of about eight kilometres sewer and over 300 manholes um, that uh, require uh, attention. So this um, slide here probably gives you a good indication of uh, where we're intending to work and what type of work we're intending to do. And um, much of the work is about increasing the, the core capacity of the network. Um, so all the flow uh, that you see is um, on, the, on the east side is running from north down to south. Um, and then uh, on flow then is conveyed from the west to the east along that bottom uh, uh, sewer that's shown running into the Golden Island pumping station in the um, bottom right of your screen there. So just to give you a kind of a feel for what is involved there, all the lines in, in purple are the new, the new rising mains, all the, the green lines are the sewers that have been uh, upgraded using open cut uh, methods of construction, and all the amber lines are those where we envisage that there will be tunneling works. Uh, the red um, lines there indicate the sites uh, on which we'll be working. Uh, and along the tunnel section, those sites will be where the uh, truss and reception uh, pits will be, uh, and ultimately where the permanent manholes will be on the tunnel sewers. Um, so it's some local uh, landmark points there, just to give you a reference. So you can see up in the up in the, up in the top of the screen there on the N6, you have the Radisson Hotel further towards the town centre. Uh, and down near Golden Island pumping station, you have the Golden Island uh, shopping centre uh, and Clone Castle then on the, on the West Bank. Uh, and the sewer works then uh, open cut along Abbey Road and then tunnelling along Custom Place uh, along the Strand and uh, some open cut excavation along the quay uh, and then tunneling uh, across the Shannon with uh, putting in place the upper Shannon crossing and then the lower Shannon crossing uh, by way of tunneling as well, bringing all the flow um, to Golden Island. We have some open cut then in Payne's Lane. We're replacing the Coosan West pumping station and we're removing the West Bank, West Bank pumping station so that flow can go by gravity now from the west side to the east side. We're replacing the Golden Island pumping station. And we're removing the west side pumping station, so all flow uh, from the western catchment that's served by that pumping station will also now by, go by gravity across the North Shannon crossing into Golden Island. So significant element works, but all in the core, core part of the network. And that core part of the network is where the bulk of the issues arise in terms of stormwater overflows and, and sewer flooding. We're also uh, removing the Abbey Road pumping station, which has two significant overflows. And then what I'm showing here is the uh, complete picture in terms of the rehabilitation works and the, sewer, and the network upgrade contract works where the um, 
where the rehabilitation works that are dealing with the inflow and infiltration that we see on the network are shown in that uh, kind of turquoise color. And that's spread out much more dispersed across the network, but is particularly prevalent along the canal there on the east side of the river. Um, and we also have sections uh, uh, more, more, more dispersed though, but on the, sorry, uh, the, the canal is on the west side. Um, and then on the east side, it's more dispersed uh, across the network. Um, a big element of what we're doing um, is the increase in capacity at the Golden Island pumping station. Um, at the moment, we're serving a population of about 22,000 PE. We're obviously not doing that effectively enough. So um, we need to upgrade that pumping station. We're putting in a new pumping station in Gold Island and increasing the capacity up to 36,000. But ultimately, it'll have uh, the um, uh, capacity to be upgraded even further uh, when growth materializes up to beyond uh, 50,000 PE. There's a stormwater storage requirement of 4,100 4, to prevent spills, um, to, to reduce spills and to, and to prevent flooding on the network. And then we have a, a big storm pumping uh, capacity of nearly 5,000 litres per second, um, so that um, at peak rainfall events, up to one in 30 year rainfall events, we'll be able to, to manage the network and prevent any any uh, flooding uh, being uh, occurring up on, up up at street level, and um, that that'll that'll be a significant improvement to the network uh, from what's there at the moment. And in terms of conveying more fell flow to the to the treatment plant, we're increasing the capacity from an existing two hundred up to two seven five. But we will have through M E upgrades the potential to go to three ninety again when when future growth materializes. So uh, as we've kind of indicated, there's a large element of the scheme involves uh, tunneling, tunneling works. Um, I suppose tunneling generally reduces impact on the environment and the urban, nat natural environment and urban environment. Um, what we envisage is, you know, shafts in the diameter of four to six meters. Um, and in the scheme, we, we, we have depths varying between seven and, and 11 meters. Um, with anticipated diameters of uh, 1.2 meters internal. And um, so in the pictures here, we've got a, uh, a typical uh, setup with a tunnel boring machine. So that's doing the excavation at the front, but the drive is coming from the um, hydraulic rams um, uh, within the drive shaft that you can see on the far, far right hand side. And they're pushing the pipes through um, behind the uh, tunnel boring machine. And uh, we have uh, two projects actually at the moment um, under construction um, on site. Uh, one of them in Roscommon uh, is, is using this type of uh, technique. And both that, that uh, project in Roscommon and also one in Mallow uh, are both um, uh, trying to achieve the same objectives as this, as this project in terms of dealing with our Urban wastewater treatment directive uh, non-compliance, um, and, and both of those uh, schemes are also listed uh, on, under the ECJ, ECJ ruling as being non-compliant with the directive. When we're trying to deal with um, inflow and infiltration, well, particularly groundwater infiltration. Uh, for, for smaller diameter pipes, we'll be using uh, cured in place uh, liners. There's a kind of a process to this in terms of doing CCTV survey of the sewers first, uh, obviously identifying where the uh, damaged sewers are, um, undertaking a design of a liner uh, to be installed, uh, putting that liner in place, and then uh, that, that liner is, is kind of a, a, a GRP liner that's flexible. Uh, but once it's cured using UV, it becomes a pipe within a pipe. Uh, and these liners then don't uh, rely on the original host pipe in terms of strength. Um, and uh, there, there have been 
I suppose, delivered by, or this type of work has been delivered by Irish Water under a national programme using regional contractors at the moment nationally. So we have um, very high quality standards in place in terms of uh, um, what type of liner and what type of resin that we require. And we also have standards that cover the CCT survey of the pipes and a, a, a systemized process then for assessing the risk that takes account of the, the damage that we see and the criticality of the, of the sewer as well. Um, I just mentioned earlier that we were doing some advanced works there along the quays, and th this is some of the, the footage that's come back to, uh, near Athlone Castle on the, on the West Bank. Um, this is a brick sewer, probably put in the 1800s. I wouldn't be surprised if it was put in as part of maybe the uh, maybe up upgrade of the, the custom barracks, because uh, we've seen this type of sewer in other garrison towns. Um, but uh, I suppose interesting to, to note is that obviously the, the shape of it is quite varying. It's not in straight lines. And we've seen a lot of um, uh, scarring of the wall, for example, in the middle photograph there, where a flow from a culvert has come in and probably undermined the wall over time. And on the right hand side, we can see a lot of uh, silt debris, I think some concrete as well in the sewer. Uh, but more, maybe more worryingly, uh, up at nine o'clock and three o'clock. I hope you can see that on the, on the, uh, on the presentation there. But there's um, deformation there uh, within the wall of the, of the sewer structure, which is obviously, um, so it's cracked through bricks. Um, so the, the the structure itself is under stress. Um, and I, I suppose, like, how do we deal with that? Uh, do we use the same type of technology as the um, smaller diameter? Well, we could, but um, what we are proposing to do in, in this case is actually use um, prefabricated liners that are that are measured up um, and then installed and then grouted, as you can see in the middle photograph at the bottom, uh, into the existing into the existing um, sewer structure. Um, and you can see there on the, on the bottom uh, right hand side how the finished product looks. So again, we've been using this type of technology on the larger uh, man entry sewers around Dublin as well, and um, particularly under, say, for example, Lewis Crossings, and it's um, been been very successful. And the liners for Athlone are are actually sitting, I think, in Dublin Port at the moment and are waiting uh, delivery to Athlone and. Uh, at the moment, what we're waiting for is the river levels to drop uh, so that we can get into the sewer network, because at the moment, the inflow and infiltration is so high, it makes access and dealing with existing flows very difficult. Um, some ex unexpected things that we found from our recent surveys include some uh, piles from obviously some building works that were going on. Uh, and we found um, thousand rounds of ammunition, a gun, and a hand grenade in the sewer. Um, so that wasn't uh, as uh, anticipated, and I suppose we had to uh, alert the appropriate authorities in terms of managing and disposing of these. But we uh, subsequently found out that these um, uh, the ammunition had been there for over a hundred years. Um, so it gives an indication of the last time that somebody was down there looking at uh, the sewer itself. But um, interesting nonetheless. And just in terms of time frames of what what works the, the contracts and the works we intend to do, uh, in terms of network upgrade works, we've the detailed design is complete um, and uh, it's been put out to tender. Um, and tenders are currently being evaluated. Um, and the CPO uh, has been published, and we're anticipating a contract award in, in late 2022. Uh, with the contract completion in, in 2025. I suppose because of the uh, nature of where the project is at the moment, I, I probably can't answer any questions that have kind of a contractual or commercial nature. But I would hope that uh, once the project is nearing completion, that we'll see the project team along with the successful contractor. And uh, once they're talk still talking to each other, coming back and giving further presentations on how they got on and how they overcame the challenges that are posed uh, by the works, uh, by the proposed works in that loan. 
and the sewer rehabilitation works um, we're hoping to uh, get underway in, in mid-2022 when the weather when the weather uh, improves and the water levels reduce with that work uh, being completed uh, in, in late 2023. So the, the main benefits that we see that are going to be delivered as part of the scheme is obviously the reduction in risk of uh, sewer flooding under non-extreme rainfall events, the reduction in inflow and infiltration on the network. Uh, so that, that will culminate and reduce hydraulic load with, low, with lower operational costs, both in terms of energy and treatment. Addressing uh, the non-compliance of the stormwater overflows or CSOs, discharges of the river, um, which brings us into compliance with uh, national and EU legislation, uh, providing that, that future capacity for growth and commercial, commercial development in that loan, where they're envisaging out to 2031 under the MPF, uh, as we said, the growth up to 30,000 from the current 21 or 22 that is in, in that loan. And we're also providing growth beyond that because of the nature of what we're doing. Um, these assets are, are difficult and expensive to build. And um, so you, you want to provide um, sufficient capacity for much longer than that. So we're looking at timeframes of greater than 25, 25 years in our design. And also we want to see improvement in water quality in the River Shannon which will be a benefit uh, because of the recreational use of the river in that long. So that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. I think Sean is up next with his, so uh, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentations. Thanks, bye. Thanks very much, Michael. Very interesting project. Sean, then the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here to present uh, um, uh, our, our work really with uh, Dr. Ronan Wilson. Uh, and this presentation uh, largely overlaps with the, with the very interesting presentation from Michael just there. Um, the topic is on um, really about the value of industry and academic collaborations in uh, sustainable design of critical water infrastructure. And um, I mean, we're seeing the, the, the word sustainable uh, come up time and time again, but really there's three uh, key pillars uh, behind the word sustainable, and that's uh, society, uh, economy, and, um, and of, co of course the environment. And when you look at critical water infrastructure, uh, it really underpins all, all of three, these three pillars. So it's incredibly important. Um, so really um, in terms of an agenda, there's two parts to this presentation. Uh, firstly, I'm gonna give a, a background really um, at a high level, a global level on critical water infrastructure. Uh, talk about some of the importance and uh, the importance of it, uh, the challenges and, and, and indeed the op opportunities uh, for collaborations going forward. And then I'm going to hand you over to uh, Ronan Royson, who's going to provide a very interesting case study that we did uh, between the university and that uh, and board work construction. Um, and he'll talk through everything from an overview of the design through the collaboration, validation, and construction and impact. So, um, but just to get started, um, so my background is uh, water engineering. Um, I did uh, some time at uh, the National University of Ireland, Galway, in, in terms of research. And um, looking really at the uh, practical research in a way where it can solve uh, real world problems. So it was a lot of uh, what I focused on. And anyway, Go is a fantastic place as a great uh, engineering legacy, which goes back to 1885 when um, Michael O'Shaughnessy graduated from, it was then called um, Queen's College uh, Galway, and then uh, went off to San Francisco and done some fantastic uh, work in terms of engineering uh, infrastructure, dams, bridges, and water supply systems over there. But um, nowadays, um, the, the, the Alice Perry building has uh, hydraulics and tidal basin labs with fantastic resources and facilities for um, blue sky and commercial research for things like renewable energy and uh, urban hydraulic uh, structures research. Um, lots of very, very good uh, resources and facilities. Um, but uh, where I am today actually is uh, uh, a spin-off from that uh, working group at the university is a Vortec Water Solutions, and I'm leading that uh, spin-off currently. And Vortec um, uh, focuses on the supply of innovative, sustainable, uh, patented products to the global water and wastewater industry. Um, so we're focusing largely on wastewater treatment currently. We're looking at a, a broad uh, spectrum of applications. Um, we have products deployed across Ireland and the UK, and we're um, rolling out our services as far away as New Zealand and in the Middle East. Um, so. What we're providing to the market currently is a new aeration technology, which um, 
arised out of um, uh, several years of intense research at the university. And we're rolling that uh, technology out to the market for um, efficient retrofits at wastewater treatment plants to uh, reduce, uh, reduce energy use and, 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 and improve uh, efficiency of treatment. Um, so this is just an image uh, video on the top left of one of these products in the field. Um, and we're currently rolling out a number of more of these solutions across Ireland and the UK and as far as well as India uh, over the next year. Um, at bottom two videos then are um, uh, computational fluid dynamic simulations, which we'll get to talk about in more detail in this presentation. Um, but it just comes to show how, how advanced numerics have come in, in the area of um, engineering, where you can now actually simulate uh, wastewater treatment plants or indeed uh, wastewater infrastructure um, well ahead of construction time to, to derive value and to optimize um, and de-risk a project. Um, on the right again, just um, kind of following on from the, the kind of discussion that Michael was given in terms of urban drainage infrastructure, the CFD tool has been used quite uh, regularly here as well. So this is a, a project we did in, a, um, in New Zealand um, for uh, efficiently dropping uh, storm wastewater flows over uh, an elevation difference um, efficiently and safely. So that just gives you an idea of where, um, how, it, how numerics have advanced um, to date and how these tools are of value. But um, in terms of uh, today's presentation or this evening's presentation, um, it's really about critical urban water infrastructure. So um, a lot of us are, will be quite familiar, um, but uh, it, it starts really with uh, drinking water treatment. Um, we abstract water from rivers and lakes and it's treated to uh, a quality that's safe for consumption. And then that's delivered into society, either by pressure pipe systems or, or pumping systems. And then once it's um, processed in an industrial setting or, or it becomes waste downstream of, of a domestic uh, dwelling, it becomes wastewater. And then the challenge switches to open channel flows, um, gravity or pumped, and getting that wastewater from A to B, um, minimizing maintenance and, uh, and minimizing energy, of course, to get it from A to B. There are a host of other challenges that start to come to play where we deal with uh, largely multi-phase flows. So uh, air water flow situations, uh, highly sediment, um, um, sediment, high concentrations of sediment in the wastewater, uh, susceptible to um, sedimentation of sewer systems, uh, fat soils and greases, and also things like rags. So this becomes a, a whole other uh, challenge. And uh, Michael has given some very good examples there in, in the previous presentation. And eventually it ends up at a wastewater treatment plant where um, energy is, is um, put into specialized treatment process to get the wastewater to a, a quality that's suitable to discharge back to the environment. So in, in terms of them four uh, categories, um, obviously why, why is it important? Well, uh, it underpins the critical aspects of public health, look at the bottom line, and of course safeguards the environment against pollution. But um, there's also a direct correlation between uh, long-term strategic infrastructure projects, particularly water infrastructure projects, and sustainable economic growth. Um, also, it's a great source of um, uh, for providing green and sustainable employment opportunities across society. And then there are other aspects such as enhancing recreation and leisure and safeguarding sites of heritage. And, and Ronan, uh, in the case study uh, that he'll talk about in a few moments, is, gives a very good example of that. Um, what are the key challenges then at a global level? Uh, well, well, there are many, but I'll, I'll walk through the key ones right now. Um, climate change is, is the obvious one, the one we're hearing about every day. Uh, so with climate change, we're seeing more intense rainfall events. And this is putting um, extreme uh, pressure on existing um, uh, assets that are, that are really at capacity. And then a, a good example there is uh, the image on the right, which shows um, a wastewater treatment plant in the US, uh, which is flooded. And uh, it's obvious from this, that this is a critical and imminent uh, public health uh, concern that obviously needs to be addressed. But it also shows the importance of ensuring the capacity is there for our, um, our uh, drainage systems to avoid that happening well into the future. And population growth, of course, and, and then couple that with rapid urbanization. You're going to see more wastewater volumes being produced, but also more impervious uh, layers in, in cities, meaning there's going to be more uh, rainwater runoff into old sewer systems. For example, that what uh, Michael Goss described, 200 years old, they're already at capacity. So major challenges. Um, looking forward then for new systems, how can we make maintenance more sustainable, safe and efficient for the future to reduce long-term operational costs? So um, again, Warden Burke um, 
do excellent work on this front, and Ronan's going to give some great examples about how you can design um, in, initially to maintain low maintenance costs long term. Uh, energy intensity. So it's known that in, in certain articles referenced that um, the summer between three and seven percent of the world's electricity usage is used in the, in the process of transporting and treating water. So it's massive energy demand and obviously carbon emissions associated with that. Um, and then of course, a big one is aging infrastructure. Again, great examples by Michael, uh, 200 year old infrastructure still working um, as it intended, but at capacity. And then finally, um, lack of infrastructure capital. Uh, it's not just a, a challenge in developing countries, but also in developed countries uh, across the world. So that's a, these are the major challenges. Um, so with that said, um, you know, it, it, these can be solved. And uh, what it really comes down to is what we believe is um, a strong collaborations uh, at all different levels, you know, between uh, a government level, um, commercially, and also at technical levels. Um, so at the National University of Ireland, Galway, and Warden Burke done, done some very good work, um, which Ronan will present, um, on... on um, sustainable validation really of, of uh, new designs uh, for sustainable infrastructure. But as part of that, we developed a, a somewhat a framework uh, around the relationship between academia and industry. And that's shown in the graphic there on the, on, on the left. And um, really what, what it describes when it comes to water, um, industry and academia are essentially, uh, you know, the, uh, two different sides of the same coin. Um, and in the middle, what's, what's bridged is this magic area where all the innovation could happen. Um, and uh, it's also at the location where startups and the startup e ecosystem can play. So where we can like look into industry and uh, look at the, 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 the upcoming major challenges that are faced and, and the data sets from live prototype facilities and bring that back into the academic setting where you can use the latest technology or the latest uh, um, um, innovation to um, solve these problems. But really it's a circular, it's a circular framework. Um, and just lastly, before I pass it to Roman, there's just two articles that might be of interest to um, the out there to read. And the first one is uh, on um, a publication I was involved with recently with the IHR. Um, and it's on um, the crossroads towards the, the sustainability goals in terms of uh, hydraulic structures. And um, really, this goes into numerous things. It touches on the industry academic gap. It also touches on other, other important aspects as engineers. And we have a duty also to communicate to the public um, usually the public would look at water infrastructure as, as something that's unseen or it's behind the scenes. And uh, as long as this works, there's no problem. But once a, an event or a bad event happens, everybody's talking about it. So I think it's our duty as engineers, and it's described in this article, to communicate that better out to the public, the importance of this infrastructure. And then secondly is another article, um, which was uh, a collaboration between IHR and uh, the United Nations, which is on... Um, really the role of engineers in solving the sustainable development goals, um, particularly SDG 6, which is applied to um, clean water and sanitation for all. But it covers aspects such as, um, really important such as um, human rights based approaches, gender equity, uh, inclusivity, and also um, the largely multidisciplinary nature of the water um, engineering industry, um, uh, where it covers everything from fluid dynamics right down to data analytics and um, uh, electronic engineering, for example. So with that, I'm going to pass you over to Ronan, who, who gives a very good example of multidisciplinary engineering in terms of a uh, collaboration. And um, I'll, I'll just uh, leave it to you, Ronan. Thanks, John. Um, so thanks very much, Sean. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give... Um, was an example of a, of a of a project that Sean and I worked on with the with NUI Galway. Um, I suppose it's the first first project I actually worked on with Sean um, and the team there. And since then, we've I've, I've been working on the on Blanchardstown with the with 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 Sean and also down in Arklow, where I currently am getting ready to set up the the treatment plant down 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 there for, for the people of Arklow. So I'm going to talk about the the Putney project um, that Warden Burke were um, were design and build contractor for. So this is part of the, the Greater Thames Tideway project, um, which, uh, which involves um, the collection of the stormwater overflows around the city of London. So it's a similar problem to Athlone, except I suppose on a, big, a, bigger, a bigger scale. Um, the, the sewers in London were built in the 1800s when the, the capacity, when the population of London was around 4 million. Um, 
that current population of London is 9 million and has an anticipated uh, population of 16 million by 2060. So the, the sewer network in London is it's on its knees, to be honest. Um, slight rainfall, you see overflows into the River, Th River Thames and uh, if it's quite visible in the Thames with any sort of rainfall. Uh, you view the overflows and you see the, the, the storm overflows in operation. So the Thames Tideway project is in some ways a simple project in they, they're tunneling um, a 7.2 meter diameter tunnel under the Thames, which is uh, most of it's actually constructed at the moment um, and all, all along the city. And then there's a series of interceptors that will pick up the stormwater over, over oh, stormwater and um, combined sewer and drop it down 40 meters approximately into the into the new super sewer and onto the treatment plant. And obviously with the with the size of the of the of the drop shafts and the tunnel, you have some attenuation built into the network. So instead of it overflowing straight into the Thames, we uh, we have a catch and it drops down into the new sewer and onto um, and onto Becton to be treated and other various plants around London. So uh, this is just a pictorial of, of London um, and along the River Thames, which the with the orange line being um, the the super the super sewer. Um, they've identified twenty five locations along the along the Thames where uh, there's currently uh, overflows uh, of, of combined sewers into the River Thames. Um, so Wardenburg were uh, awarded the, the construction of the Pony Foreshore Embankment, which was one of the, one of the 25 five, um, sites. So a very brief overview of, of the Putney project. Um, this is uh, the River Thames runs along, along the river here, along the, the bottom here. I have more pictures in a bit just to show this a bit clearer. Uh, Putney Bridge is um, again another, another bridge that was built by um, I think Basil Jet as well, uh, and it's I think it was built in the 1800s, so it's a Grade One listed building. And currently, all the sewage from Putney Main Street comes down through two existing uh, culverts and overflows into the into the put in, underneath Putney Bridge uh, down here. Um, and just have an arrow here facing where I the where where I took up this next picture. So this is the this is a picture looking back at Putney Bridge and the location of where our construction works took place and the overflow. So the overflow is underneath the bridge, which you can't see in this picture, but you can see in the next picture. So this all this these pictures also show the variation in in tide levels between in this area. So the Thames is is heavily linked to the tide and has a large tidal range, which leads to complexities in, in the construction for, for for us. So here you can see the the two overflows underneath the Underneath the underneath the bridge and a, a concrete apron, then for the overflows. So any sort of sewer, and you can even see it at the moment there. There's in that picture. There's it, there's a there's a damp spot from from sewer flow flowing over. And there's just a zoomed in picture of of the sewer and so just a simple flat valve and a, there's this kind of bird cage around it. Which um, rumor has it, it during the 1800s was used for for putting prisoners in and locking them in and uh, letting the tide take them, which. Uh, is an interesting story, whether you want to believe it or not. Um, so another quick overview of Putney uh, in the in the real world terms. So the bridge comes comes down on the left hand side, and oops, sorry, and our site is is based here. Um, so if I go back a step again, our the main tideway super sewer is sixty meters below the River Thames in this area here. And our contract in most simplistic terms was to get the flow at the high level at, from the bridge, intercept it and connect it down into the super sewer, um, 40 meters underground, 40 meters um, across away from the from the, the edge of the river. So um, there's a series to do this. There was a, a valve chamber constructed in here and also a 40 meter drop shaft, which is constructed uh, via caisson from uh, an in situ case on from the from the from the top down. Um, a curved uh, micro tunnel was driven from the from the rectangular valve chamber along the the the, the Thames uh, bank uh, underneath the bridge uh, received out and the cross interception du ducts were were created. And then also there was a cross connection from the deep uh, forty meter drop, sh drop shaft out into the Thames uh, tunnel. So that was actually done with a back actor in the London clay. So the London clay is a little bit more forgiving, and it's it's a, it's, it's, a, it's quite a hard substance. And uh, we were able to dig it in the dry 
and connect into the into the super sewer uh, underground here. So that, that sewer was constructed and we dug out and tied into it here, um, all underground and, and removed, taking out the muck. So just for, for scale, this, um, this uh, sewer pipe was 2.2 meters in diameter, which is quite a large pipe that you, you, you comfortably walk down um, in pairs probably. Um, this is a 20 meter by 10 meter uh, uh, valve chamber, a six meter diameter shaft, 40 meters deep. And again, a 2.2 meter diameter tunnel out to the drop shaft. And again, just a, a 3D view, just to give you a bit more of a, a feel for, um, for wha wha what it looks like. So again, you can see the, the, the valve, the outlets underneath the Putney Bridge, um, a tunnel along the embankment, through a valve chamber with a, an overflow uh, and various penstocks for isolation and, and double isolation of the sewer. And then there was a, this drop shaft, which contained a, contained a vortex drop shaft for dissipation of energy down to the, the lower level and then on into the, the main pen sewer and on to the treatment plant. So that's a, an overview of, of the project and, and what we did. Um, so we got involved um, and this was the, I suppose, the specimen design that we, we looked at pricing um, and what led us to, I suppose, it was a, a new, our, our design was very, it was different. Um, uh, it was probably an innovative solution to, to, to solve a lot of a lot of the tricky problems that were that developed from the tide um, connections under a, a grade one listed building in, in Putney. So there's a few a few high, uh, risks that we saw, I suppose, here on the left. And one was that uh, the open excavation along the foreshore. So they proposed using piles and um, and frames, uh, which we were concerned about from a risk point of view in terms of uh, having to excavate with barges between tides. Um, flooding of the of of, of the works and, and general risk to the to the workforce. So hence why we went with the, the tunnel option. Uh, a new chamber had to be built underneath Putney Bridge. So you can just see the bottom of it here is what they were proposing as a, an air air release chamber. Um, in order to construct this, uh, there was a, a large amount of, of temporary works required to to um, to construct underneath the bridge. Again, it was something we weren't very comfortable with uh, driving sheet piles underneath a listed a listed bridge. And just the risk of um, the risk of, of damage or collapse, which which you don't want to, to this this structure. Um, long sheet piles were used for the refuge, which is a uh, which for driving a uh, drivability, which I won't get into tonight. More of a, a civil aspect. Um, a deep open excavation for the valve chamber. We uh, we sunk everything as a, as a caisson uh, from the top, which dealt with water and. Um, and, and any risks of, of ground ground collapse. So instead of open excavation, we use the concrete, the permanent works as the at the temporary work, the permanent works as the temporary works, and the forty meter drop shaft. Um, London clay, as I mentioned, it's, it's quite forgiving, um, and uh, uh, the sprayed concrete lining was was one option. But we went with a, a forty meter deep uh, in situ caisson, and we sank it to formation, um, and it, it removed the two pass system with the sprayed concrete would need for inundation of, of water through through the concrete. Uh, so again just a, a couple of a couple of images of of, of, of the scheme. Um, so the fluid comes out will come out through a, a simple connection to the Putney Bridge, uh, down the pipe, through a, a valve chamber, uh, overflows in, in, in high wet storm flows and drop down um 35 meter vortex, which is within a 40 meter shaft, and then your connection into the into the sewer. So you can see your couple of um, Penstocks and flat valves, and a microtunnel machine was used for to form the form the bore uh, safely and and reduce any any interaction with along the, the river. Similar to, to as Michael presented uh, with the proposal and loan, and, who, and of course on the right is the finished product, which uh, we've actually just finished in the last couple of months of the reclaimed land where the where the pump station will be in in London. Um, so to go back to the brass tax tax again on this one. Um, these are the two, this is, uh, an elevation looking on. So this is Putney Bridge uh, overhead and the two overflows in blue. So the, the specimen design looked at um, having the overflows into a valve chamber, an air valve, cha an air vent chamber, and then down onto the penstock, down to the drop shaft. The purpose of the vent chamber was um, uh, that the, the, the risk was any air developing as the water came in, um, pressure, uh, an air point going back up Putney High Street and, and blowing a, a, a manhole. So they, they identified the need for an air vent here, which is the purpose of this entire structure, which needed to be piled because it couldn't be attached to the existing asset, which was Putney Bridge. So 
oh, as, as we, we put our heads together and started looking at this and the risks, we looked at, right, if we tunneled from the Penstock Chamber, we could tunnel all the way under Putney Bridge and remove the TBM on the far side. So um, this removed the, the need for, for, for uh, construction underneath Putney Bridge. We're doing anything, everything using trenchless technology um, and it re removed, removed the significant risk. However, it, the, the risk of trapped air in this area still existed and pressurizing back up Putney, Putney High Street. So what we looked at, what we, what we thought then was, what if we invert the tunnel? Um, a little bit counterintuitive that you put a reverse grade on the tunnel compared for the flow so that the air would travel towards the penstock chamber rather than back up into Putney Bridge. So this was one of the critical design items for, for the project and how we, how we manage that, how we prove that, that airflow uh, for the reverse grade. So yeah, the theory was that the air would be vented back up into the penstock chamber and then to deal with, um, with uh, sediment along the, the line, we, uh, we, we were gonna grade the tunnel in the opposite direction after pouring. So it will be a, a bit of um, a, a tromb trombone effect that it would, it would, uh, it would be coming, it, it gets smaller as you go towards the, the, the cross connection chamber. So we'd, uh, we'd slope, uh, at the base we slope towards the penstock chamber and the air would travel towards the penstock chamber. So everything would bend into the penstock chamber and uh, the base achieves self-cleansing velocity for the, for the flows. So of course, that's all great on paper, but uh, of course, what Thames Tideway came back, that's fine, but prove it works. And that's where the team in, in NUI Galway and, and, and Sean um, came into play. And so we, we, we went over to, to, to NUI and um, worked closely with, with Sean, uh, Dr. Owen Clifford and Dr. Stephen Nash and, and the rest of the team there. And uh, Colin O'Neill was 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 uh, was doing a masters with Warden Burke on hydraulics there, and was a, was was another core member of of building the a, a scaled hydraulic model of the system. So this is a, a 3D image of the model that that was that was built in for Putney, and this is built in in the lab in NUI Galway. So it highlights the I suppose the abilities of of the team in there and the and the, the space that they have in their lab to to, to construct these these elements. So this was a one into one into nine point five scale, I, I believe. Um, and on the top of the screen, you see your two overflows. Uh, your tunnel comes along on, on your stands all the way through your your penstock chamber uh, to your two drop to your two penstocks. Uh, the River Thames tidal chamber, which was a, a tricky design design element in analysing how the how the tidal effect would affect your flap valves and how it could possibly surcharge back up your Charge the the hydraulic head up the up the up the up the tunnel, and then onto your vortex uh, drop shaft. So we didn't actually model the the vortex chamber that was modeled separately, uh, but we had to model the start of it just to get the, the head loss profile and how that feeds back into the into the scheme. So at the at the at the head of the works, you, we we fed the water through pumps um, to get a, a nice nice uh, straight laminar flow into the into the tunnel. We had, we had some dissipation balls that the team got together and they pumped into the air. We had a nice flow of water as it entered the, our, our, our scaled tunnel here. Um, and then here's our, our penstock chamber, which was again built to scale with, with flap valves and the, weight, the weighted element for that. Um, and again, on your left, the left hand side, it shows the, the tunnel um, and with the flat base, flat inverted base towards the, the penstock chamber. And the silicon joints, obviously, everything has to be to be water sealed uh, within the lab. And again, on the right hand side, then is just some weighted flat valves to mimic uh, what was required there. And we could actually scale these weights back to what was what's required in the in the field for 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 constructing this. A uh, couple more pictures then of of it in operation. So we we checked uh, various flow rates, um, and exempt sedimentation, and and the surface. The air, the air generation. So the top middle, you can see how the air generated as the flow, quite turbulent as it comes into the into the tunnel and drops down, uh, generating a lot of air and energy dissipation. Um, you can see in the two pictures, really on on the right hand on the right hand side. Um, so this is just a video of the. I suppose when we looked at the air, which was the big thing, and successfully with the grade we had on the tunnel, you can see the air is always traveling towards the the penstock chamber. And away from the vent chamber up into up into um, Putney, and you can see the the air bubble traveling along 
the roof of the pipe and venting in the penstock chamber, which was exactly what uh, what we what we we designed to happen. Um, but again, to prove it in the scale model, which was which is good to good to good to show on, on the day. Um, so another aspect of the scale model was sediment and how how sediment um, would place in the tunnel, and that we achieved self cleansing velocity and we didn't get a build up anywhere. So we a, a, a series of tests were carried out with different scaled uh, sediment. Uh, and also, uh, one of the design constraints was that a, a sleeper wouldn't get caught in the caught in the system. So we had to to mimic the size of a, a sleeper going down the system, and that it wouldn't get caught on any on any bend or anything like that. So another another interesting aspect that Thames don't want a, a sleeper getting getting blocked in their sewer. So obviously some experience there in somebody dumping something they shouldn't have, or maybe perhaps the the old sewers that are there. And again, just a, a quick a short video of. Of the of the scheme that um that the team in NUI Galway um took, took. So you can see there's a series of manometers on the on the on the system. So we're measuring pressure and head loss through the scheme, and we could easily see where the head loss was occurring. It was as we anticipated, and change our design slightly based on based on head loss and weighted valves, etc. Um, can't go this far without showing a few pictures of, of the construction. Um, so on the left hand side is the is the is the tunnel that we did along the bank. Um, and you can see the scale for scale perspective, you see somebody walking down the tunnel and, and the, the vent, the, the, the vent um, just for ventilation uh, as we constructed. On the right hand side uh, was removal of, of the tunnel boring machine. So it's quite a large machine um, that was in there. So that, that was a 70 ton lift, which was um, quite an awkward piece of work in that it was had to be done between tides. And overnight, because we, we lifted it out from, from Putney Bridge. So we had a road closure on Putney Bridge, which was one of the main arteries into London. And then also working within the tides to excavate out the machine and lift it in time to, to get it out for the tidal window and our, our traffic window with the with, with I suppose expensive fines looming if you if you go over your window in London and the, the business in there. Um just a few uh, pictures of, of site setup. Um so on the right hand side is just a pictorial of, of, of the site and on the on the top then is is the is the actual site so um the site the the, the permanent work site is quite small to the right and we had to reclaim extra extra land off the river thames in order to construct our compound and and, and build build the build the work really um just another picture here of the two chambers so on the left is the valve chamber which sunk as a rectangular case on uh, so it was 20 meters by uh, eight meters in in size, and you can see the machine down there excavating as the concrete structure sank into the ground. And on the right then is our 40 meter drop shaft, um, which again was sank as a caisson. Um, and here is just a, a, a couple of uh, just a quick time lapse of the work. So you can start to see some of the scale, some of the challenges there on, on the left. The obvious one is the is the Thames coming in and out every every couple of hours and uh, the, the the barge and having to mar bore the mar uh, more the barge, uh, bringing in material as much as done by the river as possible, just to keep the keep movements off the road. On the right, then you can see the caisson being sank. So that's the, the forty meter deep caisson, uh, reinforced concrete uh, structure sank into position uh, from the top down. So all the, the concrete is poured from the top, and there's a man in a five ton excavator at the bottom uh, taking out the spoil and going straight onto the barge. Um, yeah, so then on, on the right hand side, then is just a, a picture looking up at the from the tunnel. So it's a, a six meter internal diameter shaft, uh, forty meters deep. So for for scale, it's uh, being down at the bottom of it. It's uh, all you can see is just just a light at the top, uh, dark in there. So it's uh, quite um, you're quite for, from you, when you come up here, the the bustling of, of London City. But at the bottom, it's uh, it's it's quite and peaceful. If uh, if 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 that's what uh, that's the place you're looking for. Um, left hand side, just a, a picture, I suppose, of, of the tunneling setup. So we launched from that rectangular shaft after we sank the case on into position, um, and sank the push the shaft, push the tunnel pipes from that shaft uh, underneath the bridge um, along the Thames. And on the right, then, is a is a picture of the completed tunnel, um, which sorry, it just captures the the flat flat um, bed at the bottom. For the flows to go that go, come towards the, va the valve chamber and also the you can't see in this picture but the tunnel sloped upwards towards the valve chamber so that um 
nice finished product of, of the pipe. Um, so in situ concrete pipe, which were designed and built in house. So it was a bespoke design for, for the project. You can also see in this picture how it was actually a quite a tight radius bend for the tunnel. So it was a, I think it was a 250 meter uh, radius uh, tunnel drive, which was quite tight for this size of pipe. And you can really see it in the, it, towards the end of the drive as, as the tunnel pipes start to turn. So I might um, hand you back over to Sean for the for the for, for the conclusions. Um, I think that's um, that, that's me on the on the on the case study of, of Putney. I suppose how we built it, uh, how we designed it, how we worked together to, to solve. I suppose a, a, comp a complex um, complex project, um, but quite efficiently and safe construction, which is what we're looking for in Wardenburg, is how we build it efficiently and, and safely and deliver the product to the client. Yeah, just to recap as well, it, you really can't underestimate how uh, the multidisciplinary and engineering is, is of huge importance to these projects as well, from everything I've seen in the, in the various images in Ronan's presentation. But just to conclude, really, and kind of going back to some of the topics I covered earlier in the presentation is there's a, in terms of hydraulic infrastructure, uh, it's just huge challenges for, your, for humanity really at a global level, but it is solvable. Um, and there are things we need to get right really is uh, uh, at, at various levels, including policy um, innovation and collaboration, which we described in this presentation, also um, availability of capital and, and also risk sharing is a very important uh, topic. Uh, Ron, do you have any insights or perspectives? No, I think the, the I suppose the, the collaboration between research and developing these these solutions through through NUI Galway and, and Warden Burke is uh, I suppose it's been been brilliant with with the NUI Galway team, the Vortec team, and uh, I think it's just highlighting that we can the the, the collaboration, the strength of the, the Irish industry or the Irish education in, um, groups that can solve these problems with industry when they're when they're engaged and uh, in high profile projects. So it's uh, just a, a great. A great example of solving complex and innovative challenges really thanks very much guys that's a that's a really cool project um i'm sure there will be loads of questions afterwards um okay so i'll bring up our final speaker for tonight karen um i i am going to broaden out from the wonderful engineering i've learned lots and i'm delighted that one of you is very close to me you're going to work on arclo and I know Artlow intimately. Um, uh, I'm in County Wexford, but absolutely love the West of Ireland as well. I'm going to do a little bit about citizen science and how citizens could be the allies of engineers. Uh, I'm associated with the engineering in Trinity and quite often work together with engineers and sometimes against them. That's when they have a project in mind, which might not be. Um, which might create horror in a biologist's mind. Um, I wanted to quickly cover a little bit to give you a feel of how I see nature and particularly coastal nature, and then go into more detail on citizen science and then relate that to project planning and mention climate change and the Aarhus Convention in terms of giving access to information. Our archaeological, natural, historic environment in the coastal zone is huge. Ireland has over 7,500 kilometers of coast, and we are incredibly rich. If you go to another country like the Netherlands, where almost everything is flat and straight and man-made, we have so many natural nooks and crannies. And engineers are very often swimmers as well. So you know how different it is, how you can swim through kelp forest, and through a seagrass bed and have sandy beaches. Do any of you know this? You can put this into the chat box. This is one of the things which, if you go to Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, where there are huge areas for swimming and so on, but this is no longer there. It's only in the archaeological uh, record. Do you know what it is? I'd love to see if anybody does. Um, this is honeycomb reefs, Sabellaria, and it's very, very interesting. Colonial wor worms working together, very fragile. If you drive a machine over it, it's wrecked. You see on the top uh, left, there's a lot of green on it. Those are opportunistic algae, and they grow on it 
and totally smother it if there are too many nutrients in the water. We don't have good records in Ireland of where this honeycomb reef is, but there are several areas in the west, particularly in County Sligo, where it's very well um, uh, developed. Um, crowdsourcing of environmental data and citizen science has been around for a long time, but it's now a discipline in university and is massively expanding with a huge number of papers and a lot of technology. I won't go through the detail of this, but basically the citizen should get something out of it and the scientist works with the citizen. And quite often for projects which you're planning in the coastal zone, it would be very beneficial to get extra environmental information before you start, because we are rather thin on the ground with our um, published environmental data. Quite often what I see in projects is data uh, quoted from 2004, where the shore has really changed quite dramatically since then. So explosion in citizen science work. One of the citizen science projects is Coast Watch. And I just very briefly go through it. It's sort of a feel of what it's about. It's an audit of the shore where you start with the hinterland and go over the splash zone and the intertidal to the water's edge or just into the water. Sorry. Um, what we are covering in that audit is water, any stream or other small inflow going into the, um, into the shore. And it's not just bathing water, but any shore anywhere in Ireland, and including transitional waters. And uh, we also have nitrate test kits. And for a while, we also had fecal streptococci tests, but they're quite expensive to produce. They were designed in Trinity with microbiology, but, and they're field tests, but we're not using them at the moment. We look at biodiversity, and that's the area we are really trying to expand. We're also looking at litter, swept up, dumped, and micro litter. And then we're asking surveyors for their own views and context questions which is very valuable as a feedback of what do they fear, what do they think is happening in that area. It's a basic hard copy questionnaire, which people, anybody, young or old, can fill out. And then and they're given training in if they want to, for the bio, particularly for the biology and the water stream testing, we prefer to give training. Then that's put into a database. And finally, it's mapped with GIS maps. And then when we get the results, we say, OK, what does that mean? And what do we need to do? Because the, ordinary, the general member of the public uh, quite often mixes things up. It's sort of, it's the because you're not scientifically trained, you'll get fascinated with something. You know, is it ugly, frightening, beautiful? Um, that's all in the, in the eye of the beholder. What you're trying to also teach is methodical recording. The fact it's a jellyfish. And with a photo, we can gauge the size and we can see that it's a compass jellyfish. We're also looking at climate change and more storms and particularly the frequency of massive amounts of sediment being moved and also huge amounts of um, shallow water, soft coast biota being washed out with persistent winds. And sometimes it's like a goulash of dying animals on the shore. This is becoming far more frequent than it used to. So our shores are changing and maybe that should also influence how discharge pipes are connected because quite often we are now finding them floating with the, uh, in after storm. When you're looking at surveyors, what kind of things really interest them? There is a very high motivation at um, reporting on sewage indicators. Quite often it's with photos and extra description. And that is right from the very start when we started that survey in 1987, a very long time ago with the Irish Times. Now it's all done on your phone or um, uh, inputted electronically. 
a micro litter analysis started um, a little bit later. It started when micro litter became an issue. In uh, we started on experimental way in 2013, and now it's a standard part of our survey. Um, micro litter lately includes quite a lot of fine fibers which come from geotextile, and the geotextile comes from a variety of sources, including erosion control, like an underlay, underlay of paths. So this is just a flag that this is something which has, we have noticed has really gone up. Um, further work on biodiversity, because whatever else, we have something incredibly valuable. Uh, which are our blue carbon habitats and seagrass is one such example. Seagrass habitat is really valuable and fragile. It's valuable because it is a nursery ground for a feeding ground for loads of animals, including commercial fish and mollusks. That means that fishermen also want to protect it in general, at least local fishermen want to. But few people know the grass and thus the results are not reliable. And seagrass beds, which are vulnerable to accidental damage, aren't known. And that is why it is really important if you're making sewage treatment plants or erosion control or other uh, work in the near shore zone, uh, that you do an actual field survey to check if there is seagrass or any drowned peat because of this double value of seagrass, which is very important as a blue carbon store, as well as for biodiversity. Um, a lot of our beaches, far more than we knew beforehand, particularly on the West Coast, have associated seagrass. Around Phoenix, the Coast Watch citizen scientists found an extra five uh, seagrass beds they are almost like curtains at the end of. So you've got your beach, your swimming, bathing area, and then this wonderful curtain on the outer edge, which also helps to filter and protect the bathing area. You also have a second type of seagrass, which is Sostra nolti. It's a small uh, one here, it's quite thin, which is in the intertidal. So the one I was mentioning, uh, a minute ago is much more pronounced on the West Coast and you have huge biomass of it. Um, the Jostronolti is more associated with the East Coast, although there's little bits as well. There's a fine bed in County Sligo, for example, outside Sligo town. And um, seagrass is used in the Water Framework Directive to say whether the area is meeting good environmental standard um, status. If you had a seagrass bed and that seagrass bed is decreasing in extent, in size or in quality, more than 5%, then that is showing that the, the, it is on, the, on a downward trend and may move from good status to moderate. Um, and we have found a worrying number of sites which have um, seagrass re reductions in the extent or the quality, the health of seagrass. Um, seagrass is also mentioned in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So again, it is something which we need to take into account. Um, this Coast Watch work on seagrass uh, we were working together with the EPA with an absolutely amazing trainer, educator, Dr. Robert Wilkes. You're very lucky to have him over on the West Coast, um, who has worked to us with us so that our citizen science results can uh, dovetail with the work which he's doing officially on the Water Framework Directive um, monitoring. Yesterday we, was World Wetlands Day, and um, we had um, a group out on Bull Island. We celebrated wetlands and wanted to try and do things to protect and manage them. Within a few months, local authorities will be responsible for the near shore zone under the MAP Act, which was passed on the 23rd of December. 
And there's an enormous responsibility and opportunity for, for really having integrated coastal zone management and local authority planning in that area, assuming that local authorities are given enough support and guidance and expertise. And in some areas, I think they would probably be shooting ahead on this. But one of the things to look out for again is our blue carbon. Our blue carbon, which will hopefully be counted quite soon in our nationally determined contributions for the Paris Agreement. Just give you an example here, again, on the, well, this is North Coast, uh, sea swimming, a, a group of sea swimmers found, um, um, led by Leonard Malloy, found seagrass at an island here. And typically what we are getting now is, so we're finding lots of new seagrass, which was not officially reported, which means Ireland is much richer in this blue carbon biodiverse habitat than we thought. Um, two years ago, um, it was officially estimated that there were 49 square kilometers of it, both Zostra Nulti in the intertidal and Zostra Marina. Um, the latest Marine Institute um, estimate was um, 52 uh, square kilometers, um, but likely to be closer to 100. And within the last six months, in the Coast Watch seagrass campaign, um, we have added about another 10 kilometers to the officially known um, seagrass um, riches, which we have. Here's an example of one from Inish Lacken in County Galway. Again, a, a normal person who has nothing to do with biology or has nothing, um, just giving feedback to the, our shout out, can you see seagrass? This is what it looks like. And we have the identification and um, uh, support tools on our website, coastwatch.org. Uh, so the seagrass finders, spotters, simply tell us, I think I saw seagrass. And then we get a verifier out to have a look at it and verify that it is seagrass. Um, the next step of seagrass health, which relates to nutrient uh, levels, but also pollution. And there's something else in sewage, which isn't just nutrients, which seems to be impacting far more on seagrass. So in some areas where we have stormwater overflows or raw sewage coming out, like in Fingal in Malahide Estuary, you can see a uh, a like as though somebody drove down the seagrass is parted and is dead in the area where the sewage comes out but th that's the extreme the um not so extreme is where you have a discharge pipe going into an area near seagrass and you can see a lot of fouling on the seagrass it's not this green healthy but it has a lot of fouling on it and that is, um, there's other information here as well on sargassum, but, but ignore that. So that is another thing to look out for as an indicator. Does it look healthy or has it got problems on it? Seagrass also, apart from hating sewage, it also hates disturbance. Sorry for the misspelling. Um, so coastal projects, when you want to do good, when you want to put in a treatment plant, it's really important to see where the siting of it and the actual um, dredging to make space to put your pipe in. If that goes through the middle of a, um, a seagrass bed, it may or may not recover. Now there are areas where it does and with right mitigation it, and with the right um, management, it can be translocated, kept in one area and stuck right back again. But we don't have any guidance on that in Ireland, but in some other countries they're working on that and we could adapt that to our areas. So there's potential, I think, for environmental quality monitoring around bathing beaches with authorities. And I see this citizen science 
cooperation with authorities as follows. The swimmer or bather or paddler or person who wants to put the toddler into the stream coming onto the beach, they are interested in good, reliable quality. And the authorities are interested in the same. They want good, reliable quality. So you have a common goal. But how do you get over problems? So many of our streams entering, and I'm sorry, I just realized I took that slide out by accident. Many of our streams have a big sign on the front of them saying, uh, not suitable for swimming. And right below it, you have three families sitting with their six children playing in the stream. That is asking for trouble. So really what we want is we want the streams to be cleaned up. And one of the issues is septic tanks and poorly functioning uh, treatment systems, uh, private ones, which, and there's the scheme which is going a bit slow to try and deal with that. Another one is the small treatment plants. And we're just working on one of those small treatment plants taken over by Irish Water from the County Council. And uh, we have seen a huge difference. So just want to briefly outline it. This treatment plant in my village, Bunny Money, is something we called for. Our local stream was polluted and was polluted by both people living around there, but also by the public toilets, which were going directly from a tank into the stream and out onto the beach. The county council worked together with us in a most fantastic way. We worked out how many person equivalent the plant should be. We worked out um, where the siting should be. We worked all of that out as a community. The county council sat down with us. We don't have a community hall even. So we generally sat outside the public toilets for our discussions. When the plant was finally put in, so it's only for 120 person equivalent. So it's the tiny, the minnow after seeing your huge treatment plants. But we do have over 500 of these minnows. When it was put in or when planning went through, there wasn't a single objection. We were all excited about it, even though it could not take all people. So there was an agreement that those who had holiday homes and were had large gardens would be asked to stay on treatment plants, but those who uh, didn't have the space or were there permanently would be connected. We got a tertiary treatment plant with reed bed. We would regularly go and visit it. And as a community, we worked on awareness raising that people behave themselves when they use the toilet. That if possible, use e-cover, don't throw bleach into it, don't put your pharmaceuticals into it, don't put wet wipes into it. So we had a pretty well running treatment plant with regular updates from the county council to us, I was the coordinator of that, to tell us how well our treatment plant was doing. And if there was a problem, we were also told. Unfortunately, that county council engineer retired and soon after Irish Water took over, which I know has a huge number of projects. But from my point of view, both as a swimmer and as an environmental scientist and citizen scientist who had a really good system going, it turned into a disaster because all communications stopped. People became lackadaisical. They said, Asher, I can throw anything in. And then COVID hit. And I think the bleach use in our treatment plant probably quadrupled. Unfortunately, we had things then happening at, at the other end. Our tertiary treatment system, our reed bed, died. The discharge to the stream became poor. And this is the situation which we are in now. So what I'm saying is, yes, in theory, you could do a big upgrade, but in practice, 
there is a community there which would work with you to get this treatment plant working well again. And I think maybe this is a much cheaper way and a way which is far less frustrating. And in the wider scheme of things, like in Galway Bay or in, in Dublin Bay, where you have large treatment plants, which every so often get overwhelmed by stormwater overflows, it is very important to have the timely alert and also to set up as a volunteer system with local people, the minding of people could easily on their walk take on the minding of one or two sewage overflows, the minding of a little stream and give that as ongoing feedback to the local authority. I lived in the Czech Republic for a while and we had schemes like that going locally. Um, it takes, it won't be working everywhere, but it could work. And I think this public participation is really, really important. And the trust that you tell each other and that you want, or everybody wants clean, healthy water. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. It's very, very interesting um, and a different perspective to what we engineers are always used to. 